Welcome to October 18th, 2021, downtown uh, Rotary Club of Sioux Falls meeting. Uh, I'd ask that you uh, join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd ask that you stay standing while Tony Burke comes forward to give the invocation. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests. Please join me in this invocation as you wish. It is good to recognize how different we are. Our talents, our dreams, our backgrounds, our occupations. Art allows us to dream and by definition, art is something that is created with imagination and skill and that is beautiful or that expresses important ideas or feelings. And it is good to know that when you created each of us, you broke the mold. No one is exactly like anyone else, just like every unique piece of art. Even our thumbprint and our voice track tell us how unique we are. Yet we thank you that we can take these differences and mobilize them in the good of Rotary in our community. In our differences, we can think the same thoughts and move together with a common goal. Bless us as we meet together and discover the importance of art and how it inspires us to dream. Thank you for our individuality and also for our common bond of Rotary. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Tony Burke, for, uh, for sharing prayer. We have guests amongst us and want to recognize those guests. Uh, we have a mic that will be uh, um, moving around. Uh, while we're, uh, we're grabbing that, I do want to recognize our three junior, junior Rotarians, uh, one of which we will hear from here shortly. Uh, today we have Morgan Whiting from Jefferson High School. Charlie Mickelson from Lincoln. Charlie with us today. Charlie, welcome. And Isaiah Mulder from Sioux Falls Christian. We'll hear from him shortly. Welcome, Isaiah. All right, Dan Kirby, you have a guest. I'll ask you to introduce your guest. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Welcome, Doty. And Antonio will bring the mic so those uh, viewing online can, can hear as well. Uh, Cindy Peterson, you have a guest. President Noor, fellow Rotarians, Nate Welch with the Vermilion Area Chamber and Economic Development Corporation is my guest today. Thanks for coming, Nate. Welcome, Nate. Joni Ekstrom, you have a guest. Specialist. So please welcome Shannon. Thank you, Joni. Welcome, Shannon, to South Dakota Biotech and Downtown Rotary Club. Uh, Alyssa Matt, introduce your guest. Uh, President Knorr, fellow Rotarians, I have Casey Weatherly here. Casey is the new Director of Development for the College of Fine Arts at the University of South Dakota. Mm -hmm. She's in week three. She good? Welcome, Casey. Thank you, Alyssa. And Dwayne Walk, roaming Rotarian from Rotary West. Thank you for being here. And since we're talking about uh, Dwayne, um, he is selling raffle tickets. We mentioned this a few weeks back um, for a suicide prevention uh, group called Su Survivors Joining for Hope. Uh, so if you would like to purchase that, um, he, is, uh, he is right there. Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you and, and welcome. Welcome. Uh, as you were coming in, you received a sticker. Uh, why you received that? This coming Sunday is World Port Polio Day, uh, an annual event. And for those that have been part of Rotary for, uh, for some time, you know that has been a major initiative over the decades 
uh, to eradicate polio from our planet. Uh, and we've made significant progress. We'll, we'll talk more about it next week on the 25th, uh, but do want to, to call that out. Uh, my understanding is to date this year, uh, there have been two identified cases of polio, uh, which is a significant improvement and a, a huge step in the right, right direction with that. So uh, thank you for wearing that uh, the rest of the day and, and uh, having people understand the importance of what Rotary has done uh, in, that, uh, in that battle over the, over the decades. Uh, next, I want to call out a couple of Rotarians that were on the other side of the state uh, this, uh, this past week at our district conference. Um, I want to ask both Joel Sylvester and Steve Sikorsky to give a brief update on uh, what you learned out in Deadwood. Thank you, President Tony, fellow Rotarians. So as Tony mentioned, it was the District 5610 um, conference uh, out in Deadwood. How many of you have ever had a chance to attend a district conference in the past? Okay, good. Well, for me, I was a newbie, so I'm going to give you my perspective as a newbie, and then Steve's been there uh, more times than I'll make him count uh, from the end of it as a <laughs> former district president as far as that goes. So I found out that I didn't even know what I didn't know uh, about Rotary. Uh, there were a lot of great programs uh, really focusing on a lot of things on the polio update, on membership, what's going on with membership groups uh, throughout the state. So District 5610 consists of 48 clubs from Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota, uh, represents a total of 1,575 members. At the conference this weekend, there were 175 members and 17 different clubs represented. So got a chance to <coughs> talk to clubs in a variety of different size. Um, had some programs around human trafficking, which we're going to bring some of that information to this club. Uh, had some information around leveraging technology, um, the School of St. Jude. Uh, the Peace, uh, Peace Scholars, which we've talked about here in the past and some of the things that they're doing throughout the world. So uh, overall, uh, throughout North America, there has been a, a decrease in, in membership and every group is looking to find ways to really make their uh, individual group the best it can be. So I was able to share some best practices of things we've done in Sioux Falls that have been successful. Um, and then Steve, tell them what I missed. Uh, thank you. Uh, Downtown Rotary did receive an award, uh, membership net growth in uh, 2020 and 2021. We got second place, which to me was a little misleading in that Rock Valley, Iowa won. This is net. So to do the math, if they had 29 members, they had an increase in 11%. We had an increase in 10%. But if they had 29 members and got three new ones, then they got 11% and they won. <laughs> I believe that's a little misleading. So, uh, but we had a wonderful time. Uh, we talked a lot about global grants and grants. Uh, there are grants uh, available for our district. The uh, deadline is, I believe, November the 12th. Uh, to do good in our community if we want to apply for one of those for a, a district grant. And we're always encouraged to uh, come up with uh, projects for uh, global grants. Uh, we're going to work on one for, uh, uh, where is it? Where, oh, Madagascar, I'm sorry. The president of the Spearfish Club is from Madagascar, and their club, uh, supports an elementary school over there and uh, he told me that it costs thirteen dollars a year for a student to go to school in madagascar thirteen dollars per year and they're supporting an elementary school for 400 children and uh, we do have a global grant that's been approved for wheelchairs in the philippines uh, we're working on one for ukraine that one's been uh, almost taken care of uh, and uh, COVID has, uh, has uh, delayed uh, some of those uh, rotary trips to go to those countries and working on one for Morocco and uh, also uh, one for uh, Costa Rica. So, but we got second place and got a, a beautiful certificate. So thank you and congratulations downtown Rotary. Thank you, thank you, Steve, for your passion. Uh, thank you, Joel and Steve, for your update on uh, the district conference. Uh, quick update uh, from from my uh, 
uh, lens, uh, Cindy Peterson, uh, president-elect, um, myself, and our executive director, Angie Kuiper, recently traveled to Cincinnati for the large club conference. And uh, I'll give you a high level on, uh, on what we heard, uh, but you should be proud of your club, proud of this community, uh, for what we're doing in a world where uh, there, there seems to be more um, trying to, to create a wedge or divide us, uh, to have uh, Rotarians in a room uh, working together to bring, uh, bring common good to a community. Uh, it, it's really special, and I, I think you should be proud of the work that you're doing, proud of the club that you're a part of, uh, and, and the community. A lot of Rotarians do a lot of work um, through organizations, maybe not in the name of Rot Rotary, but with that same mindset of the four-way test and, and uh, really grateful for that. And our focus, and we shared that with, uh, with those at the conference, will continue to be people. It's you. It's, it's uh, bringing new, new leaders uh, on board, uh, making sure we're engaging um, our current members. Uh, it's programming, making sure that on a weekly basis we're bringing programming that matters. Um, and the third P of people programming and um, uh, purpose is the Sioux 52 initiative. Um, uh, I was set, setting that one up, but uh, purpose through Sioux 52. And we are going to give an update here in, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, kind of a, a third, we're about a third of the year through the, the rotary year. And uh, we'll be giving an update from each of the chairs of those, uh, those different areas. Uh, and you'd be proud of the work that, uh, that is happening uh, in each one of those areas. Uh, with that, um, while, um, Steve gave an update on membership. We have a new member to induct. I want to ask Jamie Wood to come forward and uh, right here and, and uh, yep, you can come right up, uh, right up to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jamie Wood, and I am pleased to bring to the stage today and introduce Rock Nelson. Um, I knew uh, when I first come here, please, Rock. When I um, when I first got to town about two and a half years ago, and I run the Small Business Administration for South Dakota, although that's loose because I've got an amazing team that actually does makes the operations happen. But he um, was one of the first people. Uh, to actually welcome me to South Dakota, and then we jumped right in to try to make a difference for international exporting for our state and um, really open up some channels for commerce. And Rock is more than just the director for the South Dakota International Trade Center. He's an amazing uh, citizen here and also globally. He's well-renowned. Um, across the state, but also across the United States and across the global uh, commerce scene. So it's uh, unusual for him not to get a call internationally um, every single day to try to connect uh, South Dakota to the globe and vice versa, because there's a lot of people out there that want our goods and services from South Dakota. But he's also a former small business owner uh, in this area. He's um, a multi-generational uh, business owner. He's worked uh, from the time, I think you said you were a, a glimmer in your parents' eyes. Uh, he was, he's been in business and also a philanthropist. He helps wherever he can. And I was so surprised when I asked him if he was a member of Rotary and he said no, but he would love to, to be a part of it. So I said, well, come on. And when he came in here, because of rock, I'm actually getting connected to people that I haven't met yet. So I think it's a natural fit. And rock, if you just please want to tell us a little bit about your background and kind of what your aspirations are, um, welcome again. And thank you so much for saying yes. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm looking forward to being a member of this active group. And I thank you so much for consideration for allowing me to, to join it. And I'll do my best to uphold your values and will be active in whatever ways that I can be used. My parents and I um, are li were lifelong members of Sioux Falls. I'm a fifth generation Sioux Falls person. My family came to Sioux Falls in the 1870s and 1880s from Norway and Sweden. Uh, they were blue collar workers. My great grandfather on my mother's side ran the chain gang at the penitentiary when there were quarries down at the falls. and. He helped uh, supervise the 
inmates to build the walls of the penitentiary as well as the warden's home. And so we have a longstanding um, uh, generational uh, presence in Sioux Falls. My parents, very active entrepreneurs. And when I was six years old, my sister was five, we got paid a penny a dozen to count night crawlers and put them in cottage cheese containers. And my father was quite an entrepreneur after the war. He worked for Lewis Strug at the time. And then he was groomed for office manager at Morales. <clears throat> and so we lived on 7th and Cliff. My dad bought a couple of meat coolers and put a recipe box, nailed it to the outside of the garage, cut a slot in the garage, put a box on the inside to catch the envelopes that had the money in. And then my sister and I would get paid, like I said, a penny a dozen for county night crawlers. Sometimes we go through a hundred dozen in a day. And so we used that money and that groomed us to be entrepreneurs of our own. My parents got then involved in the food business. And some of you that have been around Sioux Falls for a while are familiar with Nelson's concessions. We ran all the food and beverages at the Sioux Falls Rean when it seated 9,500. Uh, the fairgrounds, the state fairgrounds, infield, hippodrome, beer gardens. We did uh, activities out of Rapid City and up and down I-29. We had a total of 125 employees part-time and then 10 full-time. My parents took out an SBA loan thanks to Jamie's predecessors and it made them all the more successful. And we worked large events, whether it was Lawrence Welk, the Carpenters, Kiss Metallica Poison, Elvis twice, air shows, etc. When my parents retired, my father continued to run Hamburger Inn downtown, of which they had owned for 30-some years. And I was forced to find my own business or create, create a business or find a job. And so I created a business and was recycling of office waste paper and cardboard. I grew it from nothing and was too proud to tell my parents that I was hurting financially. I ate cream of wheat for three weeks, breakfast, lunch, and supper, and tied my shoes in knots because I couldn't afford shoestrings. I grew it uh, to end up having seven vehicles, 23 employees, and shipped rail cars. We loaded two rail cars a day of office waste paper, cardboard, et cetera, bailed product, and 26 mills in the U.S. I exported uh, by semi and by rail to Canada, Mexico, Taiwan, Japan, China, and Korea and did it for seven years. Now, if you remember, I told you I ate cream of wheat in the beginning. The last couple of years, I grossed $2.5 million per year from the Sioux Falls and surrounding markets by exporting and selling my product domestically. I ended up selling the business to a company in Milwaukee and then uh, took a little bit of time off and a headhunter called me. I graduated from Augustana College with an econ major German minor, but a headhunter called me and was interested in asking me if I'd work for Upjohn Pharmaceuticals calling on cardiologists and heart surgeons. And I did that for a year and I had to be in rapid one week, Minot Bismarck the next, Fargo Grand Forks the next, and uh, Sioux Falls the fourth week. It was a lot of windshield miles and I put on uh, airplane miles also. It got to the point of where I ended up spending so much time in my car, I had to make appointments to see my kids when they come home from college. I have a daughter that is living in Laramie, married to the head football coach of the University of Wyoming. She has a 16-year-old son. My son lives in Minneapolis or St. Paul, married and has a five-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. And so I did cardiology and heart surgery calling on pharmaceuticals for a year and this job came available and for the past 23 years I am have been the director of South Dakota's International Trade Center. I work with companies that import and export. Uh, I deal in um, uh, issues containing documentation, rules, regulations, compliance, whether it's on the domestic side or the foreign side. I've worked with Bob Weiser and his group uh, various multiple times. And my job is to be in the trenches and assist companies uh, 
from Sioux Falls, South and all of South Dakota in the tri-state area. And SBA part, funds part of my budget, along with the Governor's Office of Economic Development, uh, Small Business Development Centers, the Sioux Falls Chamber, and the Sioux Falls Development Foundation. It's my job to keep international trade flowing. I also host foreign dignitaries and conduct international day-long trade seminars, of which my next one is coming up uh, this coming Tuesday, October 26th. I'll be having an international trade specialist in the morning, and then in the afternoon, I'll be hosting the Canadian Consul General as Trade Commissioner and other individuals from Canada. I've been doing it for 23 years. I love my job and uh, love the people that I work with. And thank you for allowing me to be a member of your fine group. I appreciate it. Wow, thank you for sharing, Rock. Um, what a story. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and I can only imagine what it's looked like the last uh, 18 to 20 months uh, uh, for you um, trying to move move goods uh, or help companies move goods across the globe. Uh, now we're gonna turn to Kayla Etram. I'm gonna ask her to come forward. Uh, Kayla has, uh, has been the chair, it was prior to the pandemic, and now, uh, as you're aware, uh, we're able to have junior Rotarians with us again, so she's the chair of our junior Rotarian effort. Here you go, Kayla. Good afternoon, everyone. We have another awesome student to introduce to you today. We have Isaiah Mulder from Sioux Falls Christian, who is involved in basketball, baseball, golf, Hosa, uh, and mission trips. He works at Minnehaha Country Club and is interested in sports, pickleball, spike ball, anatomy, and community service. So that is a very a unique and varied interest. That's awesome. Um, tying into that, he is looking to go to college after his senior year this year and major in exercise science and pre-med to become an occupational therapist. So we will learn more from Isaiah. Please give him a warm welcome from Sioux Falls Downtown Rotary. Thank you, everybody. Um, before I say anything else, I just want to say thank you for um, having us. Um, all of, uh, I think I speak for all of the Junior Rotarians, when we say we are privileged to be here, privileged to learn more about what you guys do for our city and um, outside of the city. Um, as was mentioned, I am a very active person, and so um, I want to take this opportunity to speak on the way that um, being active, being involved in activities, and um, being physically um, yeah, mobile um, has played a huge part in my life. Um, and that goes all the way back to when I was four and a half years old. Um, when I was four, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia, which is a very rare um, bone marrow condition. And an anemia is when your body doesn't make enough blood cells. And aplastic anemia means that I didn't make enough white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets, all of which are necessary to live. Um, so um, being that is a, it is a progressive disease, without treatment, I would have died within about a year or two. Um, and so the option that we took was for me to receive a bone marrow transplant, um, which took place in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota Medical Center. Um, uh, as a four-year-old going down there, it was quite intimidating. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, when I got down there, we started radiation um, to wipe out my current bone marrow, which didn't go as planned, and um, they resulted to chemotherapy um, for a few months before I received a bone marrow transplant in December of 2008. Um, as you know, um, chemotherapy is very aggressive, very invasive. Many of you probably know somebody who has been through it, and it is not fun, and it is not pretty. Um, and so as a very young child in a hospital um, who is recovering from chemo, recovering from a bone marrow transplant, um, There's very few things that brought me light, brought me joy. It was just kind of a dark time in my life. But the um, best thing about any day was physical therapy. Um, some days the only reason I wanted to get out of bed was because I knew my physical therapist was coming and I knew that for at least a little bit I was going to get to play um, just like a kid. I was going to get to be normal. Um, and so that kind of brought me through it. That brought me joy. That brought me the opportunity to um, see light and darkness in a dark time. And as I returned home, that was something I held on to. Um, I knew that what I had been through was 
um, tough, but I also knew that I had a lot of life ahead of me. Um, and I knew that the Lord had blessed me with an opportunity to move forward in life. Um, and as I continued to grow and look back and mature upon um, my experience, um, I realized that um, the opportunity to move and be active wasn't just a blessing to me. Um, it was a blessing to everybody um, else, too, who had that opportunity. And so even in my sports, I don't just play them because I enjoy them, although I do. Um, I play them because I believe that it's an opportunity to reach out and find people who um, need joy um, in competitiveness and in um, the spirit of game together. And so I believe that um, uh, opportunities like hiking, opportunities like getting out and doing anything active, while I enjoy them by myself a lot, I love them all the more when I get to take somebody with me, when I get to show them the joy that can be found in that. And that is why, um, as was mentioned, I hope to pursue after high school um, a degree in occupational therapy. It is a way that I believe I can use this joy for movement and this joy for activity to um, bring hope and inspire light in other people's lives um, instead of just allowing it to be something in my life. I hope for it to um, multiply and become something that leaves a legacy and leaves the opportunity for others to recognize um, the blessings in their life through movement and through um, the joy of being active. So thank you. When in doubt, know that we are in good hands with the next generation. Thank you, Isaiah. That was inspiring, and uh, thanks for sharing your story and your journey. Um, it uh, just never never ceases to amaze me uh, what uh, what the next generation can bring, um, and that is very true here with with Isaiah here today from Sioux Falls Christian. Uh, now we're going to turn our attention to the arts. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, that how that relates to economic development. Uh, to moderate our conversation today, we have President Elect. Cindy Peterson. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her and let her take it from here. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Tony. Gosh, I just kind of feel like we should go now after listening to Isaiah. That was pretty special. Thank you for sharing such a personal story with us. But now we're going to switch to the arts, as Tony said, and our program is going to look at the importance of arts in a community, particularly from that unique lens of economic development. I cannot be more thrilled to share the stage with these three individuals. We are in for a treat and a fun conversation, no doubt. I don't want to assume that everyone in the room knows each of you. So can you take a moment, we'll start with you, Scott, to introduce yourself, including what you do for a living and your connection to arts in Sioux Falls. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Lawrence, uh, Lawrence and Schiller, been doing that for 37 years here in this great city and state and uh, my most direct connection with the arts currently would be uh, I've been chair of the symphony board of directors for I think this is my eighth year eighth and final year I might add uh, and uh, also I'm the chair of board of trustees for the National Music Museum in Vermilion so it's my direct connection. Hi I'm Cisa Cooper um, I am a local artist regional artist and I also am a professor at the University of Sioux Falls where I teach drawing and painting. I've been on several boards in town, the uh, Arts Council, the Visual Arts Commission, and have been engaged in the arts community for about 20, 20 years. Carrie. Carrie DeGraff, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at the, for the Washington, Washington Pavilion Management, Inc. And so that's absolutely my most direct connection with the, with the arts. Super. In a program titled The Importance of Arts in Economic Development, we undoubtedly are going to use the word arts a few times in the next 30 minutes. Cisa, when you use that word or are asked to speak about this topic, what frame of mind or context would you like this room to be in with you? Well, I think it's important to first look at all of the arts separately, the visual arts, uh, theater, music, dance, poetry, movies, because we know how the state theater has played such an important role lately with the downtown scene, to think about them individually in an economic development, but then obviously to put them all together as a whole and ask the question, how can we better promote collectively the arts in the Sioux Falls community? So I think first separately and then as a whole. Carrie, Scott, feel the same about our conversation from that lens? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
we're not going to continue to be who we are if we're not embracing the arts individually or collectively because i mean that's what is so critical to bringing people to our community and our workforce development and all the things that go with the economic spin-off from that well and those in the room who might not you not know you as particularly well scott the arts, particularly music, has been a, an important part of your journey. Oh, yeah. Talk absolutely. a little bit about how. Yeah, a lot of people don't know. They think uh, I, I do advertising, but I'm actually a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Uh, I graduated from USD with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. I was a trombone player, and I was a band director for six years. And I was on my way to uh, looking at the assistant director at Sioux Falls Lincoln, and I got a call from my brother and his partner, Paul Schiller, and they said, hey, we want to talk to you. So. It just all kind of came together. Next thing I knew, here I was. So I have a very, grew up in a musical family, love music, love what it does, love how it communicates. That's really special. Tisa, why should the arts be important to each and every person in this room? Well, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> but obviously, the arts have been part of our humanity since the caveman days. You know, when uh, there were first images scratched on the cave walls, uh, musical instruments being made, some sort of ritualistic performance of some sort. So they've been in our existence forever. They're part of the, what it is to be human and that uh, ability to express oneself. But, but I think more specifically, and for this conversation today, um, I want to mention education since I'm an educator. Uh, I can't think of a better way than educating than through the arts. Um, I personally use Sculpture Walk with two different classes every semester as part of educating uh, the students at the University of Sioux Falls. Um, coming up next Saturday night is this Lakota performance at the Pavilion, which is an, an incredible uh, thing that Delta David has, has given the community. Um, the Visual Arts Center at the Washington Pavilion uh, is an incredible educational tool in and of itself with the different galleries. Again, as an educator, I take students there uh, every semester for a special project. So education, of course, is, is, at, the, at, the, is at the helm, but also um, there's an emerging group of, of new artists in town. We have a lot of young people who are staying around because the, the community is becoming so rich. Third Eye Gallery, I don't know if you've been to this, it's the little gallery inside Vishnu Bunny, the tattoo shop. Who would ever have huh. thought? It's one of the best galleries in town. Huh. So I'm terribly excited about that. And that's sort of how I see um, development. Um, obviously, economic development within the arts is huge. Um, we, my husband and I have a Airbnb in our home in McKinnon Park. And we actually have people who come and stay with us from Omaha who say we've heard about First Friday. We're coming up just to spend the weekend and see what First Friday is all about. So there's a great deal of economic development, I think, that we could push even further within the arts community. Well, and if we look specifically at economic development, uh, uh, research that was done by the Arts and Economic Prosperity, it's a study that was released in 2017. It was the fifth of its kind. Sioux Falls was one of the 341 communities that participated nationwide. The report indicated, an this surprised me, that was in a cool way. The report indicated an estimated $20 million in spending by the arts and cultural nonprofits annually in, just in Sioux Falls. And then there was another nearly 85 million spent by its audiences. That math is $105 just in Sioux Falls. So Carrie, I'm gonna look to you. What's your reaction to these numbers and do you see those numbers coming to life? Absolutely. I think, of course, they're significant, which okay. you've yeah, pointed out. But I think why those numbers are so important and more important to this conversation is oftentimes arts can be looked at as maybe something that's not necessary. I mean, it's nice. We like to have it. Going to a show is fun or it's entertaining and art is inspiring. But I think those numbers really help to provide, you know, concrete data that shows that arts are not just an investment in, you know, your community well-being and something nice to have. The arts are really critical to the economic vitality of our community. Staying with you, how do organizations like the Washington Pavilion contribute to economic development? 
Well, by providing these shows, these opportunities, these experiences, when people talk about real-time seeing economic development, when there's a show, people don't just drive to a show and leave. They gather together. They get together with friends. They go out to eat maybe downtown or at their favorite restaurant. They might grab a drink. And so right there, we're helping to support the community. But even further than that, before the Washington Pavilion really even existed, you know, the, if you look at that area of the community now with Washington Square, residents, businesses have been driven to that area and to areas in our community because of the arts and because of what was created and put there. And so it really has, you can see, just if you look at our community, you can see in real time for those of you who have seen the pavilion and, and other organizations mentioned at State Theater, others, that economic impact to the businesses, the residents, everyone around it. Scott, you are very active with the National Music Museum. How has that been contributing to economic development for our state? Well, let me, can I spin it back just a little bit before sure. I answer that? Okay. Yeah. First of all, thanks for the plug on the Lakota Music Project, <laughs> um, with the South Dakota Symphony. Um, here's how I look at it. People have asked me many times, why, why do you, why have you spent so long serving on the board of the South Dakota Symphony? I said, it is an absolutely essential tool to continuing to grow our community. Um, just read an article this morning, Sanford has a thousand job openings right now. I went assure, and I, I, I would assume that from David Fleecheck telling me, Avera has got pretty much the similar number of job openings. I will tell you, that when physicians or, or high level medical individuals, nurses, whatever, when they come to town, one of the things they're gonna ask is what's the arts community like? And then they wanna see, we take them to the pavilion and we show them around. And when they step inside Mary Summer Vold Hall, they go, whoa, this is in Sioux Falls. And they get to see that. And then they ask, a lot of them ask, well, do you have a symphony orchestra? <laughs> yes, we do. Do you have a youth orchestra? Our kids play violin or viola or cello. And, and, and then they go downtown and they see the sculptures and whatever. And, and that at its purest form is economic development, getting these people to move here because of those things that turns over into uh, jobs and payroll and other things that these people do here. When it translates to the National Music Museum, I see Nate, Nate's here um, from Vermilion Chamber. We have a close relationship. Nate's on, on my board down there. And uh, the city down there stepped up, put $700,000 into our renovation project. But we have visitors that come from all over the world to see that collection down there. And they come and they stay and they visit and they come up here. Oftentimes they fly here and they go down there, they stay here. So it just spins out. Arts spin out economic development in all factors. Do you think the arts also tied to non-art related economic impact? Oh, absolutely. In, okay. what, in what kind of way? Well, just what I talk about, jobs, mm -hmm. jobs. Every job we add in this community adds to the payroll, uh, adds to the spendable income in the community. It all spins out and it helps our businesses grow and helps our community grow. So Carrie, hearing that, does art play an important part at all in workforce development? Yeah, Scott, I think you did a good job at just highlighting that as we look at mentioned physicians coming to town, but we do do quite a few tours at the Washington Pavilion. Different business leaders coming into the community or individuals looking to maybe bring their business to our community, they come to the Washington Pavilion. They love to walk around. And I know that's very similar to other organizations in this community that are really providing that, I would say, not, again, quality of life, but I think it's so much more than that because without those, you know, that quality of life piece, they probably wouldn't come here. And I would look even to our younger generations, our millennials, our Gen Xs. I mean, I think those items are more critical to them today than they ever have been before. And so if we want to look at keeping our skilled workers here and our, you know, our, our children here and able to really have good, you know, not only quality jobs, but quality of life experiences, we need to continue to invest in these opportunities for the community long term. Well, I'm thinking of workforce development. Cisa, you're the one spending time with the individuals who are preparing for the workforce, hopefully here in Sioux Falls. How do you see it fitting in from workforce development from that lens? Yes, well, you know, uh, there's so many more careers within the arts now that are out there than there were 25 years ago. Um, 
within and music and, and art therapies, um, graphic design. So uh, we pride ourselves at USF on, on training, training people to go into the community. You know, we have people over at the pavilion from USF. So I think that there are the job market in the arts is here as well um, under that context. Well, and in, in your environment as an arts instructor, you're a talented artist yourself. Why are the arts important to the person? Individually, the yes. person. Well, I think that if we've learned anything over the last 18 months being in COVID isolation, we realize how much we missed all of that, don't we? Um, mm -hmm. Going to a live music performance, you know, going into an art gallery. So I think uh, it become comes back around to community and you know, the artist and, and whether you're a musician or a visual artist or theater, it's it's about expressing oneself to your community. You know, you're we're relating. And so I think that's the important part that as, as a community, we need that and um, uh, we need that support as well. Scott, by all measure, you're a successful business leader, a successful community leader. How does exposure to art help form or influence the way an individual approaches leadership or collaboration? Well, uh, I think Sika kind of talked about getting out and, and being able now to get back into art galleries and go to a concert uh, uh, unless they're canceled by laryngitis. But uh, uh, <laughs> Saturday night, it was a bummer. Um, but music is a universal language to me. There's a lot of music, you know, there's a lot of music. There's always music on in my office. We have a lot of music around the business. Um, I encourage, you know, I, I give tickets to any staff member that wants to go to a symphony concert. We encourage people to get out and volunteer with Sculpture Walk and other things in town. And, and, and the key to that is when you push those things and that's a part of your life and you see that as from a leadership perspective that you're interested in the arts, that makes you more of a human being to them. It makes you more of a real person. Hey, I can relate to you. There's some things I can't relate to some staff members on, but there's usually things we can find like art or music or things that help you become a real person to them and not just some figure that sits down in his office downstairs or walks around and checks on us or whatever. You know, it's just, I've always found music to be the universal language for me. And uh, uh, I've, I've, off, I've, I've taken that out into what I do. That's why I do with the board things, but that's what I do with the staff. And, and uh, I, I really think it helps form you as a leader and helps people understand the bridges. Cisa, Carrie, anything you would add to that in terms of how arts forms us as the way we approach collaboration or leadership or workforce or workplace relationships? I would just say as we look at even being a good run business is we want to people with different ideas, different opinions, the creative side of all that we all do. I think, you know, the arts play so much into that and thinking differently and getting different views and being exposed to different cultures. And uh, I think that all comes into play and any good business has a diverse, diverse thoughts coming together for the best solution and outcome. So I agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and Cisa, would you, as we look to maybe talking about Sioux Falls as a community, Cisa, would you consider Sioux Falls to be an arts-rich community? Yes, definitely. For the size city that we are, I think it's uh, incredible. In fact, we, you know, I'm from Texas, and my husband and I constantly look back on our days mm -hmm. uh, in Austin in the, in the late 70s, and we compare hmm. Sioux Falls to a young Austin. It's, wow. it's got that feel back, if any of you were ever in Austin in the 70s, it's Sioux Falls. And so to me, that only projects what, what's to come. You know, if, if we keep growing like we're growing and um, gosh, we've just seen the arts explode in the last 20 years. Obviously starting with the, the new pavilion, the building, but every year it gets better and better and more and more diverse. Um, Jennifer White and her gallery, Native Amer American Art, um, so I think we're getting more diverse in that context as well. We have a little bit of ways to go with that, but at least we're kind of heading in the right direction. But yes, I think it's a rich, I mean, gosh, our symphony, you know, the, the South Dakota symphony is just unbelievable. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of the jewels that, yeah, 
we should all be celebrating. Well, and what you just shared sparked a question that I hadn't offered. So, Carrie, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, young kids. Yeah, absolutely. How are you incorporating and how do you see the arts shaping the way you're showing them Sioux Falls and, and the world? Yeah. One thing that we've done at the Washington Pavilion and made it a priority is anytime we have, it gets lots of kids groups that come out and for with their students or their class and they come with other students and we've said, yes, you can go play in the science center and have fun, but you also are going to go do a tour of the art galleries. And I can tell you one of the most impactful times I've had was actually a, a class that was um, incredibly diverse, which is great, very rich in, in diversity. And they came into our gallery and one of the, the young boys, he just asked about, he said, is this of my culture? You know, did we help in our, I heard the story secondhand, but you know, how proud he was to see something created by his culture and make that connection. And so I definitely see the arts playing even a, a bigger role than maybe we have, but we've really started to make that a priority. Art is so fundamental. I mean, kids start out, what do they want to do? They want to color, they want to draw. And so, of course, we have our Ravens um, Children's Center where kids can come and color and draw and create. But, you know, we continue to want to develop that mm -hmm. and make it a priority. We have Young Children's Theater. I know the symphony helps to promote the young, our young you know, students who are learning play instruments there. So I think there's lots of opportunities, but the other area that we're looking at too is how do we provide opportunities for young artists specifically, just like we do with our theater programming, how do we translate that into the art as well? So lots of opportunities there. What's important for us to think about as we bring up these younger kids and being intentional, whether at the pavilion or other entities, what else would you guys like to say about the way art is being introduced to that, that really young audience? I think it's, well, I, I don't mean to speak, anybody can speak, but it's imperative. I mean, you have to be well-rounded. I mean, they can love soccer, or they can love football, but they can also love band, or they can love orchestra, or they can love art class. You know what I mean? I mean, well-rounded. Um, Isaiah was talking about his, his list of things, and you say, man, He's put a lot of experiences in his life. And as you see these kids growing up, they don't have to, you know, it's like with my granddaughter now who's 10, you know, she tries a lot of things. She's not going to excel at everything, but you get a taste of it and you understand it. That's why, you know, the symphony brings in, they call it bus day at the pavilion. I'm sure Darren knows it well. There's about 3,000 third graders that come in uh, on a day and, and they all get to experience a concert, you know, just, just let them hear it, right? Just let them hear it, experience it, sense it. So I, yeah, I agree think? with that. Creating more opportunities, educational opportunities within the arts community is, is, is you know, unstoppable. It's, it's, it's really a, uh, an amazing. I had, a, I had a young man that graduated from USF a few years ago who came to USF not knowing what he was going to major in. He ended up becoming an art major, a graphic design uh, major, and he is also a professional football player in Europe now. So, yeah. You just never know what's going what's gonna to happen, right, if you're not introduced to it early. Well, Scott, you mentioned your relationship with Nate. Nate Welch had also shared a statistic with me earlier today that young people involved in the arts are five times more likely to graduate from high school than those that aren't. Mm -hmm. is, is that possible to have that kind of impact? Oh, absolutely. National studies will, will show you that. Mm -hmm. It could be art. It could be, you know, any form of the arts, but they're much higher graduation rates. Well, I think there's a story in that for how we approach. Amen. It really exactly. intertwines in a lot of mm -hmm. neat things. So curious from each of you, where does Sioux Falls really shine when it comes to the arts? Where does it fall short when it comes to connecting arts to economic development? Carrie, you want to give it a go first? Yeah. I believe we've had some just really strong community leaders that have made, the, I think of the Washington Pavilion Project and the leaders who really fought to make that happen. Think of the Levitt, the State Theater, the sculpture, um, our sculpture walk. I mean, there's just, I think that's really, we've really shined 
and made it a priority. And we've had some great community leaders who have made that a priority and they've fought for it and they worked hard for it. And so I'm really gonna connect that to the second piece of maybe where I think we can continue to work and improve is just, you know, I do go to, especially now being enriched in, in, in this area more and gross in this area more, if I go to an art museum or a lot of times they're maybe funded by an endowment. And so, you know, I look at the, the long-term funding viability of the arts in this community. And I think, is there more collaboration? Is there some community endowment? Is there opportunities uh, to continue to develop and make it a priority for, uh, for us? And then I think the, an area that I just worry about, or I don't worry about because we have great young leaders, but you know, continuing to focus on the arts and not let it slip as we plan and, and move forward as a community and making sure we have those leaders there. Great perspective. Cisa, what would you say? Yeah, I echo everything she said about our strong leaders and, and uh, the scene that we have right now, the current art scene. One of the things that I see as an improvement is, is somehow tapping into uh, a more inclusive group of people that would show up for all of these events. Uh, we have a, a great deal of immigrants here, you know, of, of color, of different races, and I would love to see them feel comfortable at all of these things. I mean, when's the last time you saw a person of color at the symphony or at the Visual Arts Center? And so I think it's gonna take a, an effort on our part to reach out and include them, not only as artists and musicians and poets and writers, but just as, as a community coming to these, uh, uh, in, an invitation to them to come to all of these events a little bit better job doing that, perhaps. That's great. Scott, where does Sioux Falls shine? Where do we come short with the connection? Well, I, you know, we shine in a lot of areas. Um, and uh, I would agree with Seek on, the, on, on our diverse audiences that are out there because we, we can really connect to those communities and we need to do that. Um, I, I think where we might disconnect, if, it, if it's possible, would be um, we got it going on so to speak, in Sioux Falls. We've got so many great things happening. But we have to be careful to not be complacent because as fast and as quickly as you can build something up, it can go away. And we just, you know, as we talked about these, you know, the leaders, the, the, the keys, they see Dan Kirby out there, I mean, you know, was critical in our Washington Pavilion and other things, you know, we partnered on so many different things over the years. We just have to make sure that we help and educate and, and help people understand. We just got to keep our, you can never take your foot off the gas on these kind of things because as soon as you do. It's inspiring. I've got one last question. That'll leave us time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. So if that's possible, I'm springing that on you a little bit. So while we're kind of teeing that up, my last question for each of you, and then we'll open it up to a question or two from the group. When it comes to the importance of arts as part of economic development, what is the most important takeaway you want to leave with everyone in this room? So you said you have something top of mind? <laughs> Support your local artist. <laughs> <laughs> Buy local art. Yeah. Yes. It's a great way to support the visual arts community and, and know what's going on. Show up to these events. Um, yeah, support your local artist. Love it. Scott, what comes to mind to you? Well, you know, I, I saw your question and I thought about it a little bit, but you know, people, so many, all of you in this room have had, had your hands and things around this town and uh, we're all very proud of our town. Um, but 20 years ago, the Washington Pavilion had just opened up. State theater was closed. The Levitt didn't exist. The sculpture walk and the Ark of Dreams were nowhere to be found, but it was leadership from you and others in town that have had the foresight to say, hey, what if, what if we did this? What if we pushed the arts a little bit further? What if we collaborated? What if we put groups together that could get the word out and to pull things forward and to continue to fund these things? We've had over 900 sculptures come in for Sculpture Walk now. City owns 17 of them. And uh, there's so many things that we can do in the visual arts, in, in the other things that we're doing. As I said, we got to keep our foot on the gas. We got to groom that next level of leadership so what is the vision? Where are we taking this thing? And where are we going to go in the future so that momentum does not stop? I love it. Carrie. I just say 
personally to kind of, kind of like Susie said earlier, is just find ways to get involved in the arts and become enriched in them. I think it, it supports our community and it helps to, of course, just support us all as human beings. I can say from my own standpoint, I really, I, I knew the performing arts side of it. I loved music and dance and I knew less about the visual arts side of it. And since I've been more exposed, I'm, I just feel like I have so much of a better appreciation, understanding. And so I, again, just encourage everyone to find a way to get involved and find maybe if there's ways in your business or in your personal life, whether that's taking one of your child to the art, the visual arts museum, or whether it's going to see a Broadway show or the symphony or whatever it may be, um, take advantage of those opportunities, maybe bring a friend or someone with you, but help, help others to really embrace and see the importance of these in our community. So. Is there a question in the audience? Tom, the microphone's coming your way. I'd like to add to Scott's comment about complacency. I think that's a great risk in this community. We've had such a great opportunity for such a long time in this town that we risk taking it for granted. If you'd like an endorsement of the power of the arts community, about eight years ago, my old college classmate, Charlie Johnson, who runs the uh, Visitor and Convention Bureau in Fargo-Moorhead, along with the city commissioners and the Chamber of Commerce, put together a bus tour. And they called me to ask them to help organize that a whole bunch of them came down to figure out what is it about Sioux Falls that's really going on. They took a tour, they went out and took a look at the Falls Park, were amazed by that, spent time at the Washington Pavilion. Jennifer gave them a great review of everything happening at the symphony at that time. And they were just blown away with Sculpture Walk. And at the end of that, they said, you know, you guys really have it made. But I don't think we can actually duplicate that. What you had was an opportunity with the Washington Pavilion and the funding support of people like Dan and his family and all of this stuff to build that up to what it is. They said, we don't have a facility like that, but maybe we could build one. Well, they tried to float a bond to do that, and the city said, not at this time. We just can't take this stuff for granted. When other communities come in and take a look around and are blown away and saying, boy, we'd like to have it, but I don't know that we can pull it off. It might take us a very long time to get up to the standards that you guys hopefully will never take for granted. I think that's a pretty solid endorsement when other folks from the outside are coming in and saying, boy, you guys really got it made. I hope you appreciate what you got. Well, that's going to be where we leave it for today's program in interest of time. Our friend Cisa has to teach a class shortly, so we got to get her out of here in time to do that. <laughs> Please help me thank all three of these wonderful individuals. Good job, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cindy. And hopefully we hit on all three pillars today. People, uh, Isaiah, it's great to have you here. Uh, Rock, welcome to our club. And, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, programming, fantastic program. Thank you, Carrie, Cisa, and Scott for your contribution and your purpose, making arts a big part of uh, your purpose and what you do to drive this uh, community forward. So with that, uh, we will adjourn looking ahead to next week. We talked about the pavilion. We'll actually be at the pavilion in the Belvis Theater for a conversation around rural health. With that, Rotary is adjourned. <laughs>